Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we'll present this idea of using uh, uh, to improve latency uh, on CPU isolation without incurring much cost. I mean, it's a continuation of a presentation that I had last year at the same conference. Uh, this is me. Uh, I work at Red Hat, uh, improving CPU isolation, live migration, trying to like reduce overall guest latency, and also like host latency as well because well it's necessary as well. Uh, you can find me over this handle on, on those networks. Well, what we want, uh, we want to run time-sensitive tasks with very low latency. That's the like, the idea. Uh, so you can en we can enable more real-time workloads on Linux. Um, one way of doing this is trying to have this real-time task to run as uninterrupted as possible. Uh, because, well, if it's running, if it's not like scheduled or the CPU is, in, is not on interruption, there is uh, more time to process, I mean, more... Uh, um, well, it, it's ready to re respond, so uh, it's faster. I mean, it will have a, a, uh, less latency. Uh, one of those issues uh, that we have to deal with is like uh, having interruptions on the CPU that's running the real-time workload, uh, because, well, uh, it increases the latency of the workload because it may take time to process the interruption, and at this time, the, the workload won't be able to like reply whatever request that is uh, forwarded to it. So uh, one of those interruptions is called by interprocess uh, interruptions. Uh, we like the ones inserted by schedule work on and queue work on. Uh, as of today, uh, we can put some of those interruptions in uh, housekeeping CPUs uh, with CPU isolation, which is great. Uh, but there are some of them which we are not yet able to avoid. Uh, so what can we do about it? For explaining that part, I will try to introduce this problem which uh, happens in some parts of the kernel. I see that on MCG, slub and swap. But the idea is that you have a per CPU cache, which is uh, quite uh, efficient. The idea is that you are mostly touching this resource uh, on uh, per CPU uh, granularity. And whenever some CPU needs more uh, resource and you try to clean the, the, the cache that those other CPUs have, you will incur an API. Uh, it's great because you are mostly operating on local cache, uh, and you don't have to uh, use atomics or grab locks, uh, like regular locks on that. Uh, but the, the claim, reclaiming of resources from remote CPUs incurs an API, and if your processor who is uh, running these real-time tests receives this API, it, it will incur latency, uh, which we don't want. That's the general idea of such a uh, per CPU cache. Uh, the idea is that the, the hot path, you just grab local locks, do your local work, and then local unlock. And f when you eventually need to do this uh, remote, remote drain, for example, it, you just <laughs> schedule work on every other CPU that's online. Uh, but as I said, that generates an API, and that's bad for the latency on that uh, CPU. Uh, so how can we get rid of this uh, API? I mean, uh, not every situation can be done. I mean, sometimes you want to mess with like hardware registers and hardware resources, so you can do this every time. But for, some, for those three applications that I, I mentioned before, you can just, uh, for example, replace local locks with per CPU spin locks. Uh, which is the topic of my last presentation. Uh, so you get this per CPU spin lock for a CPU when you want to operate locally, and when you rarely happen to uh, request uh, an operation on a remote CPU, you just grab that remote CPU, uh, per CPU spin lock and do the work anyway. Uh, and since this operation, like this remote operation, doesn't happen uh, very often, you almost have no contention. Uh, 
there is some work that is done in this, in this way by Mel Gorman on this commit that I mentioned here, uh, where he successfully replaced uh, local locks with precipice spin locks and got some uh, performance and latency improvements. And the, the whole idea of that, this replacement is like this. Uh, you replace local locks per spin locks, and then instead of running schedule or call, you just grab the lock, the per CPU lock, and do the work that you need. Uh, as mentioned before, the whole idea of spin locks is that they are expensive for three main reasons. Uh, contention, uh, getting cache line exclusiveness, because you have to transit this cache line above, uh, between CPUs, mm -hmm. and memory barriers. Uh, which is the less of them, but the, the, in this case, in this per CPU cache case, you don't have a lot of contention because the, the drain operations are very rare. Uh, getting cache line exclusivity is also uh, very f uh, common. I mean, you are mostly having this local uh, per CPU cache, uh, cache line exclusivity because you are mostly operating in your local CPU uh, data. And the memory barriers are not supposed to be that much expensive at this point. Uh, but in any case, using the per CPU string locks will introduce like extra 3 to 15 cycles, uh, depending on you inline or not the spin lock uh, call. Uh, and for some hot passes, that may be too much. Uh, but there is some point uh, when we, we enable preempt RT. Uh, we already have per CPU spin locks for local locks. So this price that we pay at uh, the local lock grabbing and local unlock uh, is already paid. So why not, uh, let me see, why not get the, the remote spin lock and, and do that anyway? So it's already using a per CPU spin lock, it's just using for its own CPU, but we could just grab that, that spin lock and do the work that we need. Uh, that's where I introduced this idea. The naming may be not uh, final at this point because, well, but the idea is that we can queue per CPU work. And uh, this interface is supposed to keep the, the things working the same way on preempt RT disabled uh, and apply this new strategy of uh, per CPU spin locks uh, on the preempt RT enabled, as I said before, when it applies, because uh, hardware, uh, things that touch hardware, that can't be done. Uh, but creating an interface for that is kind of messy. But we need to have this new helper to request uh, and to flush the work when we need it. And also, we have to, to have a new way of getting the other CPUs, like the remote CPUs, uh, local lock at this point, because it's kind of messy if you just like, well, remote lock uh, of this CPU. So uh, that's where I introduced this idea of QPW, which means Q per CPU, right? Work. Uh, the idea here is that uh, we replace the local locks with uh, this QPW locks and use this uh, per CPU strat spin lock strategy to uh, that you use the, the strategy of using the spin lock that's already available on local locks with print enable. Uh, and this Q per CPU work will mostly uh, grab the CPU as I mentioned before. I mean, the idea of replacing it, it just happens here like in line for preempt RT equals yes. Uh, on the preempt RT equals no, it will just uh, fall back to the current functions. Uh, the, those are uh, the, the structures and functions, the, the idea of those functions that I, I just mentioned. Uh, you have just to create a new uh, QPW struct to, grab, to hold both the work struct and the, the CPU that you want to request work from. Uh, the the QPW lock is just a spin lock when print RT equals yes. So uh, the lock is the same thing. And then you just grab the, the work structure and, and run the function. Uh, the flushing is nothing because you're already uh, doing all the work. So it would, uh, 
vanish with some bugs, some, such as this one where we grab uh, the CPU was very busy, and for some reason the flush work got stuck. Uh, since the, the flush work in this implementation does basically nothing, uh, this kind of bug would just go away. Uh, the implementation of this is like replacing, for, for the first example, we just uh, used QPW lock instead of local lock and Q per CPU work on instead of uh, schedule work on or Q work on. Then I sent this implementation on the, on the mailing list uh, on those, and I implemented the, the QPW and uh, applied it on mem control, slab and swap, and in tested it to, to find that it actually was very able to reduce the latency that we experienced on, on these uh, virtual machines, uh, and also in, in the host. The advantage of this implementation where uh, we just have to manually uh, select applications that we'll be using this and converting everything, it's just that we can convert uh, uses on demand. Uh, and it doesn't mess with other users, but when we have to convert it, it may take a while because if you're running a function on this uh, Q uh, per CPU work on, you have to convert it so uh, you are not using local locks because if you, in this context, grab a uh, local lock and it, you are intended to grab uh, the, the remote CPUs lock that will be just messy, so we have to go through this uh, case with a lot of uh, caution. We have to analyze what will be called, and it's kind of hard to do that. Uh, so I was talking with some colleagues at Red Hat, and this idea came on, the idea of emulating the, the DCPU and SMP processor ID. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of hard. But it's uh, a little bit better, I mean, for uh, converting those uh, previous usages uh, because we just replaced the Q work on with Q per CPU work on. How much do we have? Sorry? How much do we have? How much? How much slides do we have to go on? Right. How much main slides? Oh, oh it's, it's, it's just that, almost. Uh, okay. Sure, sure. Um, in RT, in the early days, we had local log on, which is basically. Yeah what you suggest. Um, we had, I have no idea, 20, 30 users in total. And then I started cleaning up and we got down to C group and MM. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get around with MM folks and C group to get cross CPU access. They didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the only reason why we ended up with local log or uh, mainline. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I managed to get them all done, and except for MM, because of the latency you had. Mm -hmm. Because like memory accounting, it was hard. And it doesn't matter if it's networking or other subsystem, all of them appreciated having the same implementation for RT and non-RT. Yeah. But this, we've gone to this way, you're going to break it. Yeah. Next thing is, it's not only RT. No heads full is having the same limitation. They will also want this if you go that way. Mm -hmm. I think in the long run, you will be better off if you would uh, transform them manually one by one if um, the upstream maintainer appreciates that, to have cross CPU access instead of doing it locally. Okay, so you're suggesting that the previous idea of uh, changing the whole implementation of local locks plus API to just spin locks would be better than just using this? Yes, this is what I've been doing case by case yeah. across the kernel. I see. And yeah. if it wouldn't be for MM and C group, we wouldn't have it today. I see, yeah. Yeah, I, I tried to do that like a couple of years ago uh, to try to convince people from um, MemCG to migrate the, the, the caches for, from like local to uh, per CPU uh, spin logs, but that didn't go well. They, they didn't like the latency. That see, it was me yes. years ago, yes. Yeah, okay. I can try that again. Then. But if you go and emulate um, SMP processor ID and this CPU, and then you have migrate this every somewhere in between, this is getting messy. Kind of, yeah. But the, the idea is to create an option for the, the neck that I take before and actually try to fix this. This, this is a lot of work, I agree. But How many users fits. do you have? Sorry? How many users do you have? I found those three. I suppose there are more. Uh, for like 
not just for the, this, the, I mean, I picked the, the, the per CPU cache idea, the local log plus IPI, but the idea of this KPW is that it could replace uh, any QR cone that does not touch hardware, so we could potentially uh, save uh, a lot of IPIs on the, the per CPU, sorry, in the, the real time running CPU. Right, okay. So it just uh, created an opportunity. Maybe maybe there are not that many uh, uh, schedule work on or queue work on. So maybe it's not that, that good, but I think it's worth to try because that would remove a lot of uh, IPIs at the same point. To give another example, we had VM touch earlier, which was scheduled on each and every CPU, and it had to be that way. But then MM folks were on the other side that we could skip it, and now this is gone. VM set was one of those workers which was scheduled in every CPU every now and then regularly to update statistics or something yeah. like that. And then we talked to them and they agreed we, that they, we could slide. And that's not happening anymore. Only on those active CPUs, no longer on the is isolated ones. I see. So, so maybe you, you, you're, you're saying that uh, we first want to confirm that we can really just remove the, the thing before, I mean, that, that three use cases just confirm that they are really needed. Yes, because it's not just RT, it just uh, no yeah, full yeah. should also... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. no full to use this feature would require uh, uh, parameter RT because or else we are introducing spin locks the same way, mm -hmm. so... Okay. Well, I, I was just saying, uh, the advantages of like replacing, emulating the CPU number would be to, uh, to don't have to, uh, to touch every case by itself. We, to, uh, we would just make to work on the helpers and emulate the, the CPU number. But the disadvantage is that. Yeah, um, it's just a quick comment actually. Sure. So like the IPIs, I mean, this is from the RT context, but I've seen IPIs actually being a source of noise from CPU idle as well. So like this work is actually could be interesting beyond RT. So like making these things available outside of preempt RT only, I think there will be interest in it. Because like IPIs, I've seen a lot of IPIs just waking idle CPUs from deeper idle states and they are very hard to track. Uh, and what you are doing here is probably part of the cause, although I've seen, seen the work queues as well, especially with the new CMQs. It seems they have a scheduler of their mind where it decides what CPU to wake up. But this work would be very interesting as well outside of RT for power management, especially CPU idle management. So yeah, like we, making we this could, available uh, would be quite yeah. great. Yeah, well, yeah we, we could try to add uh, an option and try to enable it without yeah. RT as well. And it would cost the, the CPU lock and the, the spin lock and the spin unlock, but if it's interesting in some case, the, the person could uh, enable it in like command line or so. Thanks. Would it be automatically enabled for no hertz full then? Yeah, we could, but yeah. they would have to pay the price, right? The, the it, there's, price. Already a, there's already a performance hit when you enable it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, that was, uh, was <laughs> Talking next, uh, the, the option of uh, enable and disable it in, com in seven, like yeah, both. Seven, minutes. Oh, you have seven minutes left. So still. Should the next one? Okay. It's, no. it's, it's up to you. Sure. Uh, then that's uh, the slide where I would ask more suggestions if someone has anything, please, on this work. No? No? Yeah. Well, thanks everyone. I would just jump to the next one. It's uh, right here. Well, you're Well, this next topic is like improving gas latency throughput uh, by improving the, inter uh, the interaction of RCU in, in KVM. Uh, in this case, what we want is to run time-sensitive tasks with very low latency inside uh, KVM guests. And the issue that we were perceiving is that uh, we were having latency violations in cyclic test and OSLAT that were caused by RCUC uh, threads running in the same CPU as the RT tasks. But, well, what is an RCUC? Uh, this, this is the kind of uh, bug that we had to, to deal with. You, you see that there are context switches between uh, CPU and for the, the, the vCPU and the thread and the RCUC, and then it goes back to the guest and you, you perceive a latest violation. Uh, the RCUC thread, uh, 
they run RCU core when it's necessary. Uh, when I mean, when some time has passed or, and you haven't uh, uh, reported a key ascent state, I, I will go a little bit on that in the next slide. But the idea is that in RCU, if you don't uh, report a key ascent state for every other CPU that may or may not be using that structure, you will end up uh, getting a CPU stuck, that CPU that's waiting for the, the RCU to, uh, to finish the, uh, that operation so uh, it can like free the, the structure, the, the, the copy of the, the old copy, right? Uh, RCU is, is a very efficient parallel programming mechanism. Uh, in read, it does not uh, use atomics or anything like that. And on write, it just you just have to ask for every other CPU to make kind of uh, report. They are not using our structure, which we recall uh, uh, KSN state. Once they all report it, you can go on with your processing. So if you do very little writes and use that data across uh, many CPUs, it's, uh, it's a good way of uh, protecting your data. Uh, when no other CPU, when no CPU is, well, I mean, when your CPU is not uh, referring or like trying to use any RCU protected memory, it's said to be in case and state, as I mentioned before. The issue is that if a CPU stays too long without reporting a case and state, as I mentioned, the, the, the that CPU can, uh, the other CPU that's requested that uh, grace period will be stuck. Uh, that's the case for the host, and that's the case also for the guest. Uh, and you can have a lot of latency uh, on that workload, and that's not good. Uh, well, let's say that you just entered the guest. You and you report the case and state, which is already happening. Uh, you run your guest for a long while because your your vCPU is doing a lot of work, and. At some point, the timer will just interrupt you and say, well, you need to report the KSN state because I have another CPU there that's waiting for it. Uh, and then it reschedules out your uh, vCPU and scheduling in the RCU thread. Uh, if uh, you end up to the timer uh, interrupt and it asks for that. So one idea of doing this, uh, of solving this is that we report a kiss and state in the guest exit as well. So it, saved, it uh, saves most of the, the cases of like running RCUC outside guest context, but it still happens. Then you just left the, the, the guest state. Uh, but there is a chance that after you just exited, you receive this request for another CPU from synchronized RCU, and when your uh, timer interrupt happens to, to hit that part on the, its routine to check for RCU uh, reporting, it will just uh, run RCUC anyway. So uh, we have this uh, suggestion to have this RCU patience. With, we'll just act on RCU uh, grace periods requested after some time, like some microseconds or some milliseconds. So the idea is that uh, whenever we are just exiting a uh, VM, we don't get hit by uh, RCUC unnecessarily because it will just soon uh, join the, like, like enter the guest again and, and report kiss and state as well. So the idea is that we don't run RCUC and we have more CPU time for our real time workload. Uh, with those, we perceived a, a drastic reduction in the max latency on guest cyclic test. And as well, we perceived performance gain in the RT roles, even though it's marginal, it's something because you have more CPU time to your workload and less CPU time spent by the RCUC at this point because it's cheaper to, uh, to, uh, to report a KSN state in guest exit where you are sure that uh, you are in a KSN state, then reporting it with RCUC thread because you have to, su to switch back to the guest, sorry, you have to switch back to 
uh, to host uh, and schedules a task for that. Uh, thanks. Uh, what we also notice a uh, performance gain in non RQ hosts, which is quite significant. I mean, uh, we noticed like 4.5% uh, more CPU cycles that were used for that CPU, vCPU. So the guests run longer, 4.5% longer with those changes. So uh, on top of improving the, the latency, it also improved uh, around 5% of the, the CPU time available for the VM, so you can perform more work at this point with the same machine, with the same VM, just by applying those changes, because you are running less uh, RCUC and you are having more time. And that's it. The, the, the commits that I mentioned just got merged so uh, very recently, so uh, it's kind of merged, but I, I thought it was interesting to, to comment to you guys. Well, right now it's break time, but um, hey, well, I'll take one question if there is one. But if not, yeah, I know everyone wants to go for the, oh wait, there's one, one question. Okay, so uh, yes, for being sure, uh, you didn't have any peak latency in this case where there were 100 of milliseconds or, or so. It, you are just lowering the worst case scenario, but there was no problem with uh, latencies, right? I mean, you didn't have, okay. Yes, yeah, uh, we have this target of latency of like 40 mi microseconds and when it went out to that, we, we reached it to try to fix the bug. I, I'm not sure I got your question correctly. No, that uh, if it was a worst case, uh, maybe higher than what you achieve now, but there was no problem with having determinism before. Oh, no, I think it's a question that basically saying what was before you did the change, what was before the change? No, how bad, but that the worst case scenario before the, these changes was also known. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the latency that I mentioned here is the worst case scenario. I mean, I run cyclic tests for like 24 hours and get the, the CPU that performs the worst, and that's the, the number that we have here. So uh, it's the worst case. I mean, we, we can't lose a deadline. So if that one case we got a higher latency, we have to deal with that, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.